Cannabis Podcast. Gotcha. Entrepreneur, we have heard from dozens of cannabis business owners who have encountered the issue of canna bias, which is when a mainstream business, whether a landlord, bank, or some other provider of vital business services, refuses to do business with them simply because of their association with cannabis. We have even heard stories of businesses being unable to provide health and life insurance for their employees because the insurance providers were too afraid to work with them. We believe that this fear is totally unreasonable and that cannabis business owners deserve access to the same services and resources that other businesses are afforded, that they should be able to hire consultation to help them follow the letter of the law in their business endeavors, and that they should be able to provide employee benefits without needing to compromise on the quality of coverage they can offer. This is why we created the Gondrepreneur.com Business Service Directory, a resource for cannabis professionals to find and connect with service providers who are cannabis friendly and who are actively seeking cannabis industry clients. If you are considering hiring a business consultant, lawyer, accountant, web designer, or any other ancillary service for your business, go to Gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to browse hundreds of agencies, firms, and organizations who support cannabis legalization and who want to help you grow your business. With so many options to choose from in each service category, you will be able to browse company profiles and do research on multiple companies in advance so you can find the provider who is the best fit for your particular need. Our business service directory is intended to be a useful and well-maintained resource, which is why we individually vet each listing that is submitted. If you are a business service provider who wants to work with cannabis clients, you may be a good fit for our service directory. Go to gondrepreneur.com slash businesses to create your profile and start connecting with cannabis entrepreneurs today. Hey there, I'm your host, TG Brandfault, and thank you for listening to the Gondrepreneur.com podcast, where we try to bring you actionable information and normalize cannabis through the stories of Gondrepreneurs, activists, and industry stakeholders. Uh, today, I'm joined by Kenny Wright. He's the co-owner of High Peaks Glassworks, an independently owned smoke shop uh, based in Saranac Lake, New York. Uh, full disclosure, uh, he is uh, my local uh, smoke shop, uh, and, and so I, I do have a previous relationship with with him, obviously, uh, you know, I, I don't just go in there, buy a couple of papers and leave. Uh, I really like his company. But uh, so, so I want to introduce him to all of you. How are you doing this morning, Kenny? I'm great. Th thanks for having me, Tim. No, su super, super excited to have, you know, someone local. We don't have a whole lot of uh, cannabis associated businesses up here. Um, so, so before we talk, you know, sort of about your business and, and, and that whole process and, and that experience, tell me about yourself, man. How did you end up uh, in the cannabis space? Well, um, I mean, I've always had more of an interest in cannabis. Um, you know, it's just been the forbidden fruit throughout, you know, our, our lives. And so I've always, you know, been more of an anti-authoritarian, um, which is, you know, ironic that I joined the military, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, how do you go legalities. from, how do you go from the military to, you know, to, to starting a, a cannabis based, you know, associated ancillary business, you know, how, how does that sort of process play out? Well, I mean, you know, society is changing. You know, I've always wanted to be in the space, um, you know, more on the grow aspect of things. Um, and that's why, I'm, you know, I moved to Colorado, you know, for snow because I'm a snow junkie. I love, love riding my snowboard. But, uh, you know, Colorado was a progressive state, at, you know, when I had moved there in 2009. And, you know, I had gotten into that space. I had friends that were already doing it so it was just a very easy transition for me um i had friends that were running gross grow stores so i learned that aspect of the business um you know more ancillary but still you know at that time i was you know able to legally you know grow cannabis so you know i did so um and it was you know very enjoyable and uh hopefully at some point new york can progress themselves into you know allowing us fine citizens to do something <laughs> similar but uh yeah um and then 
you know, all of my family is here. So I just, you know, I, I, and I've always returned home in the summer because it's gorgeous here. Um, and it was just a very easy thing for me to do and, and come home. So came so talk home. To me, talk to me about opening up the shop. Um, yeah. you know, was there any, we're, we're in, you know, a, a purple part, more red part of the state, but, but, you know, was there any pushback from local officials or individuals, uh, you know, tell me about sort of the culture at the time. So when we initially opened the store, um, I mean, I had reservations because it is a small town and my family is all from here and, you know, social perception wasn't as you know, as it is today, you know, it, things have changed dramatically in the last five years. So, um, you know, there was, I don't want to say pushback, but there wasn't, you know, an open embrace. Um, and there was another gentleman who was running a store, um, which is another part of my reservation. I didn't want to step on his toes. Um, but after meeting him, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, providing the town a solid place you know he was uh, more of a predatory business um and there's a lot of that in this in, in the, especially the smoke shop side of it absolutely Un you know unfortunately you know there's unethical people everywhere you know but yeah in our in this business you know it it you know seems to collect them um but <laughs> so he was down the street and you know said had some reservations and you know eventually i just you know decided to put those aside and you know op we opened up uh we originally had a partner um who you know also was you know we had a falling out and you know we we went our separate ways um last year actually so i mean we've been doing this for five years um but yeah, we so we we opened up, completely renovated our store. Initially, town was pretty receptive because we have a nice store. We present ourselves in you know more of a gallery aspect of things instead of having uh, you know just product everywhere, which is from a consumer aspect, from my point, very disorienting. Um, so I like to focus on you know products and just highlight what I, I have um, and, and bring in whatever customers are asking me for. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the mayor said we had a, about a year, you know, these types of businesses typically really? fizzle out in about a year. So, you know, that was fuel to the fire, um, which the other gentleman did, you know, fizzle out in about a year, you know, but, you know, he was a predator and yeah town wasn't very receptive of him over time because he ran people out of his store it was he, he was kind of a cartoon character <laughs> so, so so since since you opened your shop five years ago how, how has your business grown like what uh products do you see sort of moving more now than than moved five years ago you know tell, tell me about the sort of evolution of uh you know apparatuses uh, as you know the cultures changed well, um, I mean, the concentrate industry is definitely moving uh, most of the industry, I feel. A lot of the, the technological aspect of things, various vaporizers, um, even drier vaporizers um, are coming along, getting more affordable. Um, yeah, and New York's medical program is definitely allowing people to, you know, become consumers on a legal aspect and, and get medicine that they wouldn't otherwise be, you know, privy to. Did you notice post medical legalization uh, an uptick in, uh, you know, the, the, the population that you might uh, sort of perceive as medical cannabis users? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the notion in, in in all things um the the medical aspect the the warm and fuzzy feeling that comes along with that um brought a lot of people who are otherwise on the fence or you know demonized cannabis um 
you know, and the CBD movement as well has has uh, done this, a similar thing. Um, it's definitely brought people, you know, out and changed their minds and, and gotten them off of the pharmaceuticals, which have a lot of other side effects that don't come along with cannabis and CBD products. I mean, uh, you know, obviously there's the THC aspect of cannabis, but you know, there's CBD, which doesn't have that negative, you know, quote unquote negative, you know, depends your, your take on it. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely moving things forward nationally and, and locally statewide. It's great. So the, the, let me ask you about CBD. You know, I mean, I, I personally get, you know, emails and, and press releases and, and, you know, sample offers from dozens of, of CBD businesses every single day. So how have you sort of navigated those muddy waters of CBD to ensure that the products you're getting, uh, you know, are to your standards and not some snake oil? Well, I mean, initially when CBD was first coming you know up and and getting more popular um you know i was re just relying on distributors um and trying to you know discern from and do in my own research as much as i could so i could provide a quality product and know what i was providing and not you know get tripped up by you know all of the buzzwords that are out there on the industry um and since then, uh, one of my good friends has started his own farm in the Asheville area, Asheville, North Carolina area, um, Other Side Hemp. Um, they grow all of their uh, plants, you know, organically, um, you know. They harvest themselves, you know, it's, it's a smaller batch thing. Um, so I've pretty much just shifted to sourcing from him because I I've known him for 20 years and I if I have a question or if there's any concerns at any point you know I can get a hold of him at you know 10 o'clock at night you know there's he he's very available and he's very open and honest you know there it, it's it's ethics you know I I'm a huge ethical individual in running my store and that's how i feel the industry needs to be um because that's really the heart of the industry you know as, as i see it so what are so, some of the challenges for you uh being an entrepreneur in a very very small town i mean especially um you know with with the coronavirus i mean it, we we shut down pretty quickly and pretty hard um so so tell me about some of just the the broad challenges uh and then we'll get to sort of the COVID stuff um well yeah i mean obviously small town you know less traffic you know we live in a very uh tourist um economy um it's middle of the mountains very beautiful but you know there's not a huge population pretty pretty good spread from town to town um we have yeah so it, as far as that goes it's challenging but people here are willing you know and and very much do support local businesses which we're very grateful for and, and thankful for all of our locals um i mean people travel for a long time you know an hour away hour and a half um because they like us you know what i mean they've they've been to other places and they they just genuinely like us and you know we we don't you let people bring their dogs in, which is really important. We, yeah, I, you know, we don't, <laughs> we don't want customers. You know, we want, you know, friends. You know, what I mean, we like, we want people to feel welcome in our store, whether they're purchasing things or not. You know, obviously, you know, we're there to sell stuff, but you know, we, you know, aren't, you know, the f you get out of our store if you're not buying a product you know like we we like conversation as you know you know like we <laughs> we talk you know every time you come in for at length so you know we're 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 part of the community you know and that's how we've you know we've worked our way into that initially 
you know, town was skeptical, um, you know, and, and I guess understandably so, but we've, you know, we've had our local law enforcement tell us that, you know, they, they're okay with us. You know, they, you know, we're, we've been vetted. So it's, it's just. What is your nice relationship to, like with them? I don't think I've ever asked it, you that. Like, it's, even it's, in a person. Very, it's a very positive relationship. I mean, we're not, we're not doing anything criminal, illegal, you know, we're not selling any, you know, you know, a, a, anything that we feel is, you know, gray area or unethical, you know, so the, and they very much appreciate that aspect because we're not trying to contribute to a problem that already exists. You know, we're trying to, you know, just, we're, we're selling inanimate objects, <laughs> you know, essentially and, and CBD products, which are legal. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's been a good thing. Um, so how how did COVID affect your business? I mean, obviously, um, you know, you were shut down for a little while. Um, and, and, you know, were you able to access or did you seek any federal or state funding? Um, you know, tell me about that, that sort of experience as a, as a you know, one shop business that, that relies on that day to day. Yeah, um, we didn't seek any, you know, federal or state aid. Um, I mean, we closed for... I, I believe two weeks or something like that. I mean, it wasn't a very long time, um, you know, enough to digest the the regulations and rules that were coming out at the time. Um, and because we are an owner operated business and we were essentially in, you know, in a loophole for the, the state regulations, we, you know, did appointments only. Um, you know, we required masks and, you know, just tried to continue as best as we could helping people, you know, social media became very, very important. You know, I forwarded all of our store calls to, uh, my cell phone. So my phone was ringing off the hook, <laughs> you know, I'm setting up appointments every day, you know, like trying to be as available as possible, but, you know not expose myself and, you know, have a life as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, as much as, as one was happening at the time. Uh, but so yeah, how, I mean, how it, has this been since the lifting uh, of of the you know quote unquote lockdown? I mean, I remember when when you sort of first opened non appointment. I, I had to I had to stand in a line in order to get in. Uh, you know, was was that something that was was temporary? Or are you seeing uh, more traffic? Um, I mean, initially, you know, when the the government was pumping out a lot of uh, you know the six hundred dollar extra unemployment payments, you know, people had, you know, money burning a hole in their pocket. So it was definitely a large uptick um, at that point. But at the same time, you know, you have COVID. So there's a lot of people that aren't coming out. You know, it, uh, you know, people were coming, getting, getting what they needed. Um, you know, we were mitigating, you know, the amount of people we were allowing in the store at the time. You know, and even still, it's it's typically like a one or two people. Yeah. To, you know, and and people keep their distance anyways because people are generally respect respectful. You know, of of others here. So, um, yeah, it, it was definitely a huge shift. Uh, but I'm I'm just really thankful that we are owner operated and we we were able to continue. Um, the Rotary Club, you know gave us $1,500 in, oh, wow. you know, you know, grant contributions, which they did for several other businesses, which was incredibly moving. And, you know, it really solidified our feeling of, you know, being a part of the community. That's you know, fantastic. And, and yeah. It, you know, it, it brought a tear to my eye literally. And, you know, it was just humbling. And, and honestly, I never, would have expected it you know it, it wasn't not so you know because we're like you know the, the redhead step you know, with the black the black sheep <laughs> i know, know there's, but, a, there's uh, a, that that super nice clothing store across the street you know right across the street it's it's yeah i mean it's well i mean it 
being a tourist town, you know, a lot of people will look in my window and, and clutch their pearls when they see, <laughs> you know, some of the products that I carry, you know, and, and, you know, that's fine, you know, whatever, but, you know, at some point they're going to have to come to terms with reality and how society is changing. So, but it, 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 it gives me a chuckle every time. I want to talk to you, you know, you mentioned at the top, you know, that, that you had, you had joined the Navy. What, can you tell me about, you know, your military experience as it related to sort of uh, the culture of cannabis? I mean, there is no cannabis culture really in the Navy, you know, there, there's zero tolerance, um, you know, regular urinalysis. Had you smoked uh, prior to going into the, into the Navy? Um, I had once, okay. um, which I had gotten a waiver for. So, um, <laughs> you had to get a waiver for smoking one marijuana. Yep. I mean, they, yeah, the military is pretty strict with that. They, uh, yeah um so but but that that was it you know what i mean like you know the the typical teenager you know uh, you know try it you know whatever and and that was it because it, it it was whatever um i continued on with my my high school career but uh yeah i joined the navy out of high school and and sailed around the world and learned to work on radar and shoot five inch guns and experienced a lot of different cultures, which made me appreciate America a lot more for the ability to change. Um, you know, so, so when was it after your, your military experience that, you know, you, you started smoking more cannabis? Oh, I mean, shortly thereafter. Uh, yeah. I mean, I didn't wait till i mean I, I i was out of the navy in 2007 you know and i have been a, a consumer i mean i don't really smoke a ton you know but yeah it's uh yeah you know the, the, I mean, I, I, I'm just trying to sort of figure out, you know, because the, I've, I've had veterans on this show and, and, you know, many of them, a couple of them were combat veterans who, you know, it was a direct correlation, their experience in the military, PTSD, uh, right. leads to cannabis. Is, is that the sort of correlation that, that you might make? Was it your military experience that uh, led you to, you know, smoking more? Or becoming a consumer in 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 really no, um I mean not I I am very thankful and grateful that my military experience didn't result in any you know trauma you know what I mean because I know there's a lot of veterans that have you know trouble with that and and cannabis is incredibly beneficial for them but it wasn't it it was just a you know I prefer that to alcohol you know what i mean i i don't you know there's no hangover you yeah. know you don't feel like trash the next day you know you you know it's alcohol is just you know I, and not to say that i don't consume a, a beer here and there you know because yeah. i do like you know alcohol but you know it's definitely far far less you know of a enjoyable thing you know what i mean like there's just and you can't function when you're on alcohol you know like correct it, which you know is a huge detractor from it you know like you have two or three beers you know your speech is off you know your coordination's yeah. off can't like, drive you know, that yeah you can't drive you can't do anything you know cannabis isn't necessarily that way cbd isn't that way you know and like yeah. cbd flower has become a huge you know aspect because you don't you know you don't have that thc you don't get that high but you still have the you know the relief you know the it, you know it's like near beer you know what i mean <laughs> it, it, you, you you can sure you know you can you can drink you know 24 of them you might get a little buzz but like it's 
you know, you're going to be, you know, in the bathroom all night. So No, I get really excited for, you know, most people who know me and, and who listen to the show know that I'm not like pro legalization in the sense that like, uh, regulation and, and all these other things because right like it hasn't harmed anybody in, in 200 years or, and even you know the, the the black market or the the illicit market right I can't wait for THC drinks like I, I, I only want legalization so I can get like a THC infused root beer oh they already have those too no I know I know I had I've had them in, in Michigan and stuff but but yeah, yeah, you know yeah. we we don't have why they avail something like that we have to go to Massachusetts Right. No, I, yeah, I'm, see, I'm just all about the freedom aspect. You know what I mean? Freedom of choice. Like all of these regulations that are, are in our lives and every aspect of our lives, you know, just need to, you know, take a, a long walk off a short period. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in your experience, what do the veterans that you know think about sort of broad legalization? Uh, I mean, we're all for it you know we're we're you know a hundred percent for it you know again it's all about freedom you know what i mean like we can sign a contract to go you know die in a foreign country but we can't consume a product which is widely known to be you know less harmful than a bullet <laughs> Well, and to, I mean, to that end, the Navy's banned hemp-derived personal care products. Right, which is absolutely <laughs> insane. Like, I don't, I, you know, that's that's extreme zero tolerance. You know, I don't, you know, there's so many hemp-derived products, you know, Dr. Bronner's, for example. I use Dr. Bronner's all the time. Hemp-derived soap, you know what I mean? Like, all over that bottle is tattooed the benefits of hemp, uh, you know, for the environment and everything. You know what I mean? Like we, we used to use hemp rope in the Navy, you know, it's, it, 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 hemp is such a historical product to me. It, it blows my mind that the Richard Nixon administration managed to like really like clamp the jaws down on, you know, cannabis and, and, just demonize the heck out of it even more so than prior administrations with the stamp act and you know and and, and all you know the reefer badness movie and you know all, all of those other things like it's it's insane yeah the the navy's policy on on anything hemp related is is just wild dude wild does, does it alcohol ever... is pretty much all right you know you can still pull into port and get absolutely shit faced <laughs> as long as you show up to the ship you know on time <laughs> relatively relative no 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 you need to be on time yeah <laughs> um does it ever surprise you that like there's not more sort of hemp activity out here i mean there's farms everywhere especially if you go up toward you know malone uh you know messina i mean it's all farmland it's it's you know it looks like you're in ohio um, yeah is it ever surprise you that we don't see more sort of hemp farms out here? Um, I mean, New York's made it kind of hard to, you know, grow hemp. You know, they have, I mean, at least initially, I'm not really up to speed on their most current. Form. Well, most recently, they actually said that they're not going to put forward a plan for uh, next season. Uh, instead, they're going to rely on FDA regulations. And they and they basically said because, um, you know, the, the FDA regulations are too onerous uh, for them to put forth a program that they're not going to put forth a program at all. Instead, you're going to have to rely on the FDA, which seems which seems really ass backwards to me. Right. Oh, the, the, the FDA regulations are too onerous. So you farmers deal with them yeah uh yeah that's unfortunate that our our state would leave us holding the bag if you know we're trying to grow hemp um it, yeah i mean which you know new york way very typical you know there <laughs> Yeah. I, I, so I want to ask you, I, I want to ask you another question. It's it's I I've only been in Saranac like a couple of years. Um you know, your family's from here. Um 
when cannabis is legalized in New York, it's an eventuality. It's either next year, you know, next session or this session after that. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that Saranac Lake will allow industry operations? I mean, they, you know, they, they were obviously sort of open arm about your smoke shop, but, but that's way different than, than selling cannabis or growing cannabis. Um, what do you think about that? <sighs> Boy, I mean, I don't, I don't honestly know, Tim. <laughs> it be you know the Saranac Lake is a very progressive town you know socially um and i i would like to think that they would allow you know the economic you know stimulus that would come you know from that you know and and not just directly from cannabis sales but like all the ancillary businesses you know hvac electric you know, laboratory laboratory all of these things that you know really surround the industry you know because science has definitely become a, a intricate part of the cannabis industry thankfully you know what i mean it's no longer like in the dark about you know what a lot of these cannabinoids are what they're doing you know we're finding more all the time um and, and that sort of thing needs to keep progressing. And and we have Trudeau Institute in in Saranac Lake. Um, you know, there's a there's a couple other research uh, facilities. So I mean, it. I feel like it would be a relatively natural thing to to do. Um, plus the tourism. Plus the tourism alone. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the bed and breakfast aspect of things, you know, that, oh, that's <laughs> in Colorado, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it, it to me, you know, and you, it, it's really a no-brainer, you know what I mean? Like, there's, it's the the economic boom that could happen really is unimaginable you know, at, at a time when we, we need <laughs> I don't imagine Lake Placid would actually no, allow. I don't. Right, Lake Placid's a different different animal altogether. You know, they're more you know pinkies in the air. They got the Olympics, you know, and holding on to that tight. You know that they're they're the super healthy town. Well, well, there's no there's there's well, no zoning I'm, laws here in Bloomingdale, so. Right. Well, that's it. You know I mean, like there's there's a lot of communities where there are none. You know, what I mean, so they're not going to be able to keep it out regionally um i don't you know i don't foresee but I, at the same time i don't know why they would want to you know stem em employment you know why they would want to you know not allow an, an economic boom in our area like it it's we have been struggling and relying on you know all of these state grants over the last several years to get our town out of you know its heyday you know from the whenever that was <laughs> like you know like it's a tuberculosis town so you know that's early 1900s you know that's that's a long time ago like there's it's it and all these grants are great and all that but we need to be able to run on our own you know like we can only suck so many tax dollars, you know, our, <laughs> our state's already in uh, the red pretty, pretty hard. And, 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 and Corona didn't help. I mean, and Corona didn't help at all, you know, like, and, and it's continuing to not help. So and the, the, one know, of the beautiful of things about living in this area during Corona was, you know, the, the say what you will about the masks, but the, the, the fact that we were so struck by this idea, we would need our businesses to stay open. So therefore, you know, we have to wear the mask. So regardless of what you thought about it, it at least enabled the, the small economic machine that we have here to keep running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so. mean, yeah, we opened as soon as we could. It is, well, I forget what phase it was, but you know, as soon as we could stop doing appointments, we did, you know, cause, yeah. and, and people were still taken aback by that. You know, they were, you know, and I still have calls now of people like, Hey, are you open? Can I come into your store? Cause I mean, there's places that you can't do yeah. that. And you know, it's, it, it's just such a weird time that none of us have ever experienced. And we're just, you know, trying to be fluid and, and go with it. But yeah, I mean, overall masks, you know, people put them on, 
You know, it, it's a very, you know, you're shopping for Does five it to ten minutes. You? As a business owner about the, the, maybe the security aspect of this, cause I was just talking, you know, to some people the other day, like, you know, I walk into a store now, you know, and I'll have a hood up sunglasses on and a mask on. I mean, you can't tell who I am. Yeah. I mean, my, I'm not like, not the safety security aspect. Like I'm more worried about the age identification aspect. Interesting. You know, cause you know, how are you dealing with that? The, well, I mean, I still ID people, you know what I mean? And, and you know, uh, thankfully, most of my people are, you know, you know, continue repeat customers. So I, I know them, you know, like I recognize them, you know, I don't have to look at their ID every single time I see them. You know, some people I don't see all the time, so I do look at their ID more often. But, you know, like some people I see, you know, every day. Some people I see, you know, every other day. Like it's... Um, yeah, it, it's, it's challenging, but I mean, it's not, it's not too hard, you know, and, and a lot of my demographic is, you know, obviously over 21, <laughs> yeah. like they're, you know, in their forties or fifties. Like I have a lot of, you know, older folks coming in, which is really honestly awesome. And I love that aspect that, you know, I have people that, you know, aren't, you know, concerned about, you know, social perception of things. It, it's, it really makes my heart sing. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you, let me ask you briefly about that, that, that switch from 18 to 21 that happened. How did that affect your business? Um, I mean, that was definitely a big cut for sure. Uh, you know, 18 year olds, <laughs> You know, obviously, have a little more like to buy all kinds of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. But you know, and they're also breaking stuff. You know what I mean? They're they're definitely yeah. good for business. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, but back to you know, freedom. You know, Tim. Like you know, if I can join the military at eighteen, you know, yeah. I feel like you know you should be able to buy cigarettes, and you should also be able to buy alcohol at eighteen. You know, you can vote at eighteen. You know, and and you know until we make all of these things equal and decide when you're an actual quote unquote adult, you know, that there's going to be those discrepancies and, and I'm not going to agree with it because it's freedom, you know, like at what point are you old enough to make your own choices? You know, marketing is marketing. They should teach, you know, marketing, you know, in, in grade school, as far as I'm concerned with the amount of, you know, colors and everything that's yeah. projected onto all of us, you know, psychological warfare. <laughs> it's, yeah, like... My last question for you, Bob, is, <laughs> is, is what advice do you have for people interested in entering the space, specifically the smoke, the, the smoke shop industry? Um, well, do your research, you know, figure out what area you're trying to open up in you know figure out the type of people that live in the area you know like are is your store even going to be successful in that area like because otherwise you're just going to be wasting your time and your money and and both are incredibly valuable so it first off second you know once you find that you know you 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 want to establish a place that you don't really want to leave, you know, you want to, so you want to make sure it's, it's something that's going to be a long-term thing, you know, cause I, I would imagine that's the type of business you want to set up unless you're flying by night, in which case I don't really have you know much <laughs> advice cause that's not me, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And then, you know, it's all about establishing relationships with artists. You know, there, there's so many talented artists out there you know melting glass and doing really amazing work um you know some are just you know depending on where you are you know location it, it will really dictate the type of product that you can carry you know like if you're in the city where there's obviously a lot more money um you can carry pieces that are thousands of dollars you know and and sell them you know where here, you know, I, I put a, a $500 piece, you know, and, and people, you know, are going, 
and doing mental gymnastics to figure out why it costs so much money, you know, and like, I, and I try to convey why, you know what I mean? But at the same time, some, you know, some things are just hard for me to even grasp because, you know, like it, it's art, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's art. So if it doesn't speak to you, then, you know, you're not going to see the value in it. And, and that's, that's very much how a lot of this industry is. So, you know, that and, and really just customer service, you know what I mean? Like providing quality products is going to allow you to not have to do as much, you know, problem mitigation with customers because you're not selling poor quality products. You know what I mean? Like, obviously things are mass produced and in very like batteries, Kirk batteries, you know, those things are made thousands you know who knows how many are coming off the line but you know so there's going to be failures but it's you know most people are very understanding you know like as long as you are as long as you're not you know the the f you get out of my store type you know people are are, are you know are people you know you, you talk to them like people they respond like people you know like it, it's all about giving people respect and you know yeah and, and you'll go far you know like but if especially if you're in a small town you know if you know you're in a city you could probably get away with being a little bit you know of a d-bag but you know that's <laughs> still your prerogative it's, it's not a successful business move you know it's, it's funny how far we've come that you know like five years ago you couldn't walk into your store you know and that's about the time when i when i uh, stopped running shops what well, you know you couldn't say bong it was actually I, I stopped running shops probably eight years ago ten years ago at this point anyway but you couldn't say bong and and you know now you know that that culture's changed so much that you're able to not have to sort of be as much of a dick because you know no one cares if you say bong anymore right yeah i i, I want to say ohio um set precedent on on that establishing par paraphernalia quote-unquote as art and you know eliminating the bong term but bong was an issue in 2006 when john ashcroft la launched operation pipe dreams yeah. and you know everybody that said bong or sold bongs got you know yeah. arrested and jammed up on you know trump charges so put tommy Hong's yeah. tommy chong's head on a platter they did yeah um, yeah unfortunately man, thank he's you doing great now <laughs> yeah th th thank you for for coming on the show man i i, I you know it, we we've had th these similar conversations uh in the shop which is why i really wanted to sort of bring them uh, a little bit more public because uh, because um you know i ran shops for a very long time and and you know your shop is one of those shops that it reminds me of the stuff that i used to do and you know and and the you know with the the strange art you've got on the walls and and you know your your eye for quality products and american made glass um you know was was always the big appeal to me um so so why don't you tell people where they can find out more about your shop and uh you know what you guys do over there well, I mean, we're brick and mortar. We don't do any online sales. Um, yeah, you know, that that's it's a dicey market out there. I'm not trying to, you know, touch toes in that. But we're on uh, 82 Main Street in Saranac Lake, New York. Uh, phone number is 518-354-5469. And if you're ever in town, stop by and uh, check us out. We'd love to have you. Cool, man. Again, man, Kenny Wright, he's the owner of High Peaks Glassworks, an independently owned smoke shop based in Saranac Lake, New York. Dude, thanks so much for coming on the show. And uh, I'll see you, you know, when I need papers here in a couple of days for sure. <laughs> Sounds good, Timmy. Thanks for having me, man. Peace. You can find more episodes of the Gontrepreneur.com podcast in the podcast section of Gontrepreneur.com on Spotify and in the Apple iTunes store. On the Gontrepreneur.com website, you'll find the latest cannabis news and cannabis jobs updated daily along with transcripts of this podcast. You can also download the Gontrepreneur.com app in iTunes and Google Play. This episode was engineered by Trim Media House. I've been your host, TG Brandfault. <laughs>